He was born in Berlin of Lithuanian diplomatic parents. He went to the, uh, uh, he studied international law at the University of Rome, very close to the Vatican. He was secretary of, of a Lithuanian delegation to the Holy See. He has done a number of uh, articles, a number of speeches. He was part of the Lithuanian resistance during the, the communist, uh, during the Russian occupation. He actually functioned as a conduit between the West and the Lithuanian partisans during the occupation. They so trusted this man that in 1990, they specifically named him as their spokesman in the West should the Russians change their mind and stay. This was the man who was to speak to the West for the Lithuanians. In 1992, he became ambassador to the United States. In 1993, he stood for president of Lithuania and got 38% of the votes, which is a good deal better when you think about it than Ross Perot did here. <laughs> so this is a, a seasoned, articulate voice coming to us tonight, and we're extremely fortunate to bring you, I hope I get this name right, S Ambassador Stasis Lozaritis, the ambassador of Lithuania. I'm very much flattered to be uh, called the Lithuanian Ross Perot, I understand, <laughs> I must say. But I certainly <laughs> don't have his talent, so please. Uh, I'm uh, a moderate speaker, and I don't know how to speak very long, so <clears throat> I think that we will divide um, our time in two parts, uh, with your permission, and I will make some introductory remarks and then answer your questions if you will be good enough to have some, and uh, we will go into discussion about Lithuania, and I think not only Lithuania, but about, about Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, because Lithuania is part of a huge problem, a wonderful problem, because suddenly uh, we were talking now just a few minutes ago that uh, three or four years ago, Lithuanians, when they said, oh, we want to be free and independent, everybody looked as at us as if we were uh, fantastic people who didn't understand anything about the realities of history and uh, looked at us uh, with sadness because they thought that we were uh, finished. And yet, round the corner of history, suddenly came this day and we could uh, proclaim, <coughs> restore our independence. You know, <clears throat> I was in Washington at that time, and first of all, I would like to say that uh, I will never forget the uh, attitude of the American people. I've been, uh, uh, I've spent nights at the State Department, which is so um, many times criticized for its, uh, I don't know, insensibility. In my case, it was not the case, the State Department, had a group of uh, uh, emergency, uh, well, emergency group, I would call it, of wonderful people. And I am not say, uh, telling it because I want to be nice, but this is the truth. We had exceptional people at that time who were working with the Bolts for their independence, were helping and doing what they could. And then there were the Americans from everywhere who telephoned during the night and who said, be courageous, uh, have patience, uh, do whatever you, you can uh, <clears throat> in order to arrive to the independence, etc. And we will uh, telephone, call the congressman, the senator, and so on, and help you as far as we can, and so on. It's a wonderful feeling. And I think that it, uh, I will always remember it for one very simple reason, uh, which we all uh, sometimes forget. And that is when America was founded, this huge republic was founded, what exceptional men there were who wrote the Constitution, 
who organized the United States of America and what uh, a wonderful spirit there was at that time. And the spirit must be kept, I hope it will kept for, 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 for many, many centuries uh, to come. Yes, the Russian troops were withdrawn, thanks again to the pressure from America. Let's not forget that there is such a thing uh, called Byrd Amendment. The Senator Byrd introduced an amendment uh, which provided for restrictions as far as the assistance to uh, Russia are concerned and uh, saying that if the Russian troops would not be withdrawn till um, uh, the 31st of August of 1993, certain parts, not humanitarian, but uh, simply economical uh, assistance to Russia would be stopped, completely stopped. And I think that was, of course, extremely uh, important in uh, obliging, in pushing the Russian army out of Lithuania. Still, uh, there are many problems after the uh, disappearing of the Russian soldiers, which I can assure you, we have nothing in contrary to see them in their country. Uh, we don't uh, hate them, we don't dislike them, we like them maybe, but in their own country, not in Lithuania. <laughs> <coughs> which is now the case. And why? First of all, because they left Lithuania in shambles. It is, uh, <coughs> it is incredible that such an empire, an empire, the Soviet empire, which existed for, for, for 70 years after all, could have, mm, could have reached such a bottom of, uh, of economical, of spiritual, let's not forget it, of spiritual, of mental, of educational mm, uh, problems. Everything has to be rebuilt, reconstructed, restored, everything. When I uh, went back to Lithuania in 1991 and 92, I was astonished uh, that in, in the cities you would not find one single building painted or in good shape or any apartment which would be really acceptable to a Western to live in. Everything was, you know, seemed as if a, a huge uh, war or something terrible would have happened in Kaunas and in Vilnius and the two, and Klaipeda, the three uh, main cities, and other places also, because there were no painting, uh, paints. There were no, mm, uh, well, nothing with uh, uh, people could buy and keep their houses and their apartments and their flats in order. <coughs> nothing. You couldn't find it. And it is so strange when I think today that uh, this empire uh, for 70 years seemed for t to some people in Western Europe, at least uh, to the communists of Western Europe, as a model to follow. This is if such a model would have been followed. Oh my God, I think that uh, Western Europe uh, would be also in shambles today and w it, it would have been a, a catastrophe. What are the main problems today. I would say one part of the problems are economical problems, of course, because you must eat, you must work, you must do something, you must produce, and then, of course, you go over and you start thinking, as the Latin said, uh, primum, uh, uh, first you eat, and then you go to the philosophy and become a philosopher. But the problem is that <laughs> Uh, we have huge factories in Lithuania, factories which can produce anything, but they are all obsolete, in very bad shape, and they produced uh, anything for the Soviet Union. Our, uh, our directors of these factories could just sit down, relax, and wait till the Russians would come and buy anything they produced. 
We produced computers which were 50 years behind their times, absolutely obsolete. The Soviet Union would buy them. We produced horrible shoes. The Soviet Union would buy them. We produced ho other horrible things. I am sorry to say so, but I mean, they were really horrible. And still, the Soviet Union ruled by them. And that was the tragedy, because people just didn't learn how to show their imagination, how initiative, how to look at the public and uh, at the consumer. They didn't know what it means to, uh, to a market research, to see and to find out what the consumers wanted. And this, even today, is a problem. We have this huge interest in which we still have. We have, first of all, to modernize, and you need huge ca capitals for this. But then you have to turn it around and make it face the West, and uh, finally uh, send out people to the West and find out whether the Germans would like to buy, I don't know, red shoes or black shoes, whether the Spains, uh, Spaniards would like to see uh, materials of a certain kind of not, which we, we, this information we still don't have. And therefore, even to start a production is very difficult. I'm very happy to say that with the help of American Lithuanians, we've organized an economical section at the embassy, which is now connecting the American businessmen, the American companies with Lithuanian businessmen, with Lithuanian companies. And I think that um, the good news, uh, I left the, the office um, just uh, an hour ago, and the good news was, for instance, that an American company wanted to buy any quantities of cement we were producing. And uh, we are producing a lot of cement, because again, <laughs> we, we have a huge uh, factory which produces cement, and uh, we can furnish it to the whole world. And we will try to do that, of course. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, what else? There was another uh, good news that um, uh, some American companies wanted to go to Lithuania and open up. For instance, you uh, <clears throat> mentioned the Westinghouse company is active in Lithuania and so many other companies. And I <clears throat> want to say that this is the moment when the companies should go to Lithuania. And they should go not with the intention of staying only in Lithuania, of working only in Lithuania, but they should go to Lithuania because it has a good infrastructure after all. It has people who speak uh, foreign languages, who speak also Russian, and therefore the American companies or the Western companies could organize their headquarters in Lithuania and then look to the rest <laughs> of the continent, to the, to the former Soviet Union, and it means, what does it mean? The, Soviet, the former Soviet Union was a huge country of 22 million square kilometers. Now, in miles it would be a little less, but at any rate, three times mm, uh, the size of the United States. It's mighty, mighty big, I mean, I must say. And now you can start your uh, trip in Lithuania, go by car to Vladivostok, which is on the uh, um, on the um, uh, ocean, uh, on the other side of the, the continent, and you cross through free countries, more or less free, independent, <laughs> and countries which would like to be democratic. That means that if you have a headquarters or you have some uh, starting something in Lithuania. It means that you can export them, you can uh, send people to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc., with, with uh, countries with which we have good relations now and with which we uh, could also start um, a trade, a new trade. We are unfortunately, I will say why, I will explain you why I say unfortunately, exporting still 70% of our commodities, of our products to the East. And that was for, for, for very simple reasons, because what we produce is still not of the quality, of the necessary quality to be accepted in the West. But in two years from 
nothing. We are already at 30% of our exports. 30% of our exports go to the, to the West, which is quite an achievement. And the achievement was, <coughs> is the achievement of private initiative. Any, I mean, any time we have a success story in Lithuania, it's a private initiative. That's why we want to privatize as soon as possible and as much as possible in Lithuania everything, with the exception of certain absolutely essential, uh, I would say, points, like, uh, for instance, the nuclear power plant or the railways, which we think that the state should um, subsidize and so on. But all the rest, about 85 or even 90 percent of the economical uh, activities should be in the hands of private people. Because they have, and especially the young people, they have the drive, the, 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 the dynamic uh, drive, I would say, to go forward, to go to the West, to find out, to create, and so on. Well, when I talk about um, people and when I t uh, say, well, we have good young people who would uh, do quite a lot of uh, things, I must uh, say that the, mm, the, the consequences of Marxist regime, of course, are very grave also in the minds of the people. First of all, let's start by saying, and I, I told you, I mentioned already, that uh, everybody was, you see, the, the law, the fundamental law in the Soviet Union was don't do anything. You will be told what you, you should do. Just sit and wait. And no initiative, no absolute original uh, thoughts, nothing. Moscow will tell you what to do. But Moscow was very, very far from, uh, you know, from Lithuania, even from Lithuania. Moscow was very far from the Siberia. And still, it was Moscow who decided how many tables you were supposed to have in you in, in, in the state restaurant. Moscow decided how many chairs you had in, let's say, in a new hotel and so on, how many beds, etc. Everything was centralized. This mentality of sitting and waiting for orders is still there. And we have to fight with it. We have to open the minds to the modern world. Sometimes people, our people, don't know that they don't know. That means that they're in good faith, that they can't imagine that the modern Western world is progressing every minute. Every minute goes forward. While we speak here, while I speak here, in, the, in, the, in, in, in 20 or 30 minutes, <coughs> probably a very important invention in some kind of, I don't know, technological or medical or philosophical or etc. will take place in this, uh, on this earth. And therefore, we must, it means first of all, that we must also reorganize the universities and the school. We can't accept the universities which were organized by the Soviets, which were numerous. Uh, we are producing now about 9,000 engineers, which is uh, a year, which is an enormous sum for a small country. But they are not, when they finish their studies, they are not prepared for any job, modern job. And this is a tragedy also. <clears throat> Therefore, you see another problem. Uh, change the universities show to the professors that there is something new. We have to uh, send them to the West. We have to send the students to the West. I'm very glad to say that quite a lot of them come to America and continue their studies. Uh, journalists come to America, uh, not, even, uh, not only professors, but uh, uh, teachers, and learn quite a lot. And this is the most important but the West is not even uh, asked to give us financial aid. That is not so important. But we are trying to get as much as possible of this, you know, collaboration with the West, which would be uh, essential uh, to us. The privatization is going on. Now it has slowed down, as you mentioned before. 
we have a strange situation where about um, about 55 percent of the population, in, inclusive the minorities, have voted for people uh, for former communists. How po how is it possible? You will ask. How is it possible that people who have been deported, who have been shot, who be who suffered, who 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 didn't, uh, who couldn't get out of Lithuania, who couldn't learn what they wanted, who couldn't choose their profession, and so on, suddenly are so uh, in love with um, with people who were members of the Communist Party? Well, <clears throat> it will unfortunately happen in other countries too. I expect it to happen in Poland in the next elections, unfortunately. And it will probably, ha it, it's already, uh, it has already happened in Bulgaria and Romania and so on. And it is a very unpleasant thing because <coughs> those former communists, uh, they come without any experience of real modern, uh, of how to administer a really modern state and therefore I don't think that they can solve uh, swiftly any problems uh, in, in Lithuania or, or Poland or whatever it is. But at any rate, it is the, the fear of no, n new things, new solutions, uh, the fear of reforms which stop the people uh, from going uh, forward. And uh, when I was traveling uh, during the campaign in the, in the country, I was usually received with really great love and, and, and absolutely wonderful uh, were the crowds. But they were, when I talked about new, something new for the country, I felt that the people were very, very tense and they, were, they didn't know what it meant. They thought that probably it is a risk to, uh, to, to start reforms in Lithuania. But the reforms, there will be, because the private organizations, which now collaborate with private organizations in the West, in America, in Germany, in Italy, in France, and I think that these private organizations, newsmen of, uh, of doctors, for instance, you know, we are getting uh, through these private organizations a huge assistance from America and from other Western countries in the medical uh, field. Uh, can you imagine that uh, today we are probably 25 years behind the times as far as uh, hospitals are uh, concerned? That the all the nice gadgets, gadgets uh, you can see and you can find in a Western hospital is a dream for Lithuania, and still. <laughs> doctors do what they can, they operate, they learn, and they, I think that their talents are very big and very, uh, very important, but um, it will take probably some 10 years, another 10 years, till we reach an uh, acceptable uh, level of, of medical, uh, of me uh, acceptable medical uh, level. The same thing is in, in other cases. Uh, <clears throat> do, there is always a danger, not only for Lithuania, but also for Latvia, Estonia, and for other countries, of a return of Russian conservatives. And that is one of the main <coughs> problems, political problems, with which we have to, uh, to deal. You see, Mr. Yeltsin is doing what he can. Maybe he is not a good man, but he is the best we can have. And there is no question about that. There is no other one who could take over and continue his job. <laughs> and he is doing what he can, but a huge army of former bureaucrats, of former Communist Party members, of former uh, army members, and so on, is still there, and they are not really <laughs> communists but they long for the times where they would solve the problems with a policeman, with force, without discussion, where one man would be, uh, well, 
maybe the dictator, a democratic dictator, and they look at all these new republics in the Soviet Union and the former Soviet Union and uh, in the Baltic with the greatest distaste. They think that this is a question of uh, a few years and everything would then fall, uh, uh, I would say, in, in the right, into the right place and everything would come back to the situation that existed in 1990. And uh, it is true because uh, in one Moscow, in, in a very important office in Moscow, and the general staff, uh, you can still see a huge map of uh, the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, the Baltic States, and Eastern Europe, and it hasn't changed a little bit. And one of our people went there and said, well, uh, General, don't you think that it's high time you change the map because so many things happened in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And the general, you know, reminding me of the certain types of uh, Dostoevsky who knew how, and Tolstoy who knew how to uh, describe the, the, the type of a Russian general, said, well, wait, come in about five years and you will see that this map will still be here that will show you the real situation. And he, you know, smiled with great, with great wisdom, saying, "Well, don't don't get excited." Well, I hope not, because first of all, we are approaching the 21st century, and I think that you feel, as I feel, that the 21st century will be very different. Of course, it will not come immediately, but we are approaching new times in communications in. In, in communications among people, in communications of, among countries, in, in, in technical, uh, technological communications. We must maintain politically the liberty and the freedom for all the people because only then people, the men, can, uh, can create and do something which is worthwhile. The democratic institutions in our country are for the time being, I wouldn't say strong, but they still exist. But I would really hope that the West would monitor the situation, not only in Lithuania, but in other countries, and be very, very, and very carefully, and would react immediately if something bad happened, as far as democracy is concerned. I think one of the uh, help uh, we get uh, is the help the uh, World Bank and International Monetary Fund gives us because it obliges, it says, uh, it, 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 it says that if you want a credit from the World Bank, you must keep a certain policy, you must keep a certain, um, uh, you, you must continue the reforms and it obliges uh, even former communists to uh, follow a certain path and go on 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 the democratic uh, were, I would say towards democracy but and another thing which I would like to stress and which I like very much as a former um, well I, I never was a newspaper man, but still I, I worked very close with newspapers and I worked for some time in New York and I enjoyed it immensely. I must say that the Lithuanian press is not only free, really free for the time being, but it is also very original. It uh, writes ab with, with, you know, uh, great feeling and passion. And uh, I must say that it is a very nice surprise that young people who never saw and never could uh, even imagine that they would uh, see a Time magazine or something in Lithuania, now can write in an original and useful way for the democratic, for the strengthening of the democratic uh, structure. What uh, what possibilities do let's come uh, let's go back to the uh, conservatives. What possibilities do they have? What are the real dangers? How can they be strengthened? I think one of the great danger is if the West will show that it 
tolerates certain things in Russia. It should never tolerate the, 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 the conservative politics, never for any reason. Sometimes people think in the West that it is much better to oversee, not to react to certain things, and just to forget not to offend the Russian people and uh, to close the eyes uh, um, when they see an unpleasant fact. That is a mistake. Uh, we are really, we all uh, the people from Eastern Europe are absolutely convinced that you must, you, the Americans, and of course the Germans and the Western Europe, etc., always react with a certain, uh, anima with a certain energy uh, when you see that uh, democratic uh, structure and the democratic organizations are being weakened or even um, overcome and uh, <laughs> neglected or, or, or weak, uh, first of all, weakened. That is very important because if we will see, if other countries will see that the, democra the, the democratic uh, regimes are not able, are not willing to defend democracy in these uh, countries, that would be very dangerous. <laughs> I think that this is the main, uh, these questions are the main questions which uh, uh, I hope will uh, help you to, to make an idea about the Lithuanian situation today. It is a, a beautiful country. It is a country with great uh, possibilities of tourism. I hope uh, very much that uh, you uh, will have enough uh, um, time and opportunity to come and see it with your eyes. It is a very romantic country, and it is a country which has also huge economical uh, possibilities. We have one of the greatest uh, refinery in Europe, which can refine uh, a lot of crude oil, which we can't get from anywhere. And <laughs> if we could get some crude oil from, uh, from the West or from the Kuwait or uh, uh, Arab countries, that would be wonderful. It can refine about 15 million tons a year. And uh, we, this is a very great amount that we must, as soon as possible, make it work. We have one of the greatest nuclear, unfortunately, I say unfortunately because of the, the Chernobyl-type nuclear power plant uh, called Ignalina, which is breaking down now and then, and which makes us think very much what to do with it. It is a huge problem because we could sell uh, for one billion dollars a year uh, the power to to Poland, to Germany, and so on. But the debate is on whether we can tolerate such a danger on our th uh, territory. Because if something would happen uh, with Ignalina and in Ignalina, then I would say that uh, the, the existence of our country would be jeopardized, and maybe it would be the end of, of the Bo all Baltic countries. Um, then uh, we have uh, a, p a port which can be used by everybody. We are welcoming. Mm, I think you understand the importance of port. Uh, here we have a, another beautiful port. By the way, I would like to remind you that we have an agreement, economical agreement with Maryland. I had the honor of signing it with Governor Schaefer at the Lithuanian Embassy a year ago. And uh, it, uh, it's not yet um, going very strongly because I think it is our fault, but still the foundation has been uh, uh, put and, and we might uh, do something uh, with it. And as I said before, we have a port which is functioning even in winter. It is not a huge port, but it is an important port. and. Um, Russia and uh, other countries of Western Europe and Eastern Europe can use it. We will gladly mm, uh, accept and uh, uh, let uh, them use as for their transit. Uh, uh, if you um, look at the map, you probably will remember there is a, 
enclave between Poland and Lithuania, which is called the Kaliningrad region. Well, that is a problem. And as a diplomat, I'm not supposed to talk about that. But, I, <laughs> but very often, I'm not a diplomat. And I do things which are not diplomatic no, at all. I think that this problem, sooner or later, will have to be solved peacefully. But that a Russian enclave in that, uh, in that place would not serve anybody. And I have the impression that the Poles and that the Scandinavians and that the Baltic peoples and uh, our peoples, with the exception maybe of the Germans, whose territory it once was, are inclined to solve this problem and uh, find a mutual and uh, maybe a, a joint venture for this um, uh, piece of uh, territory because it's in a very uh, good strate uh, economically strategic position, but it is n now not used in any way, not in any way which would be useful for the uh, neighboring countries or even for Russia. But um, as I said before, I was very much criticized by Moscow for mentioning the name of Kaliningrad, and I was accused of uh, wanting to break up the relations between Germany and, Mo and, and Russia and so on and so on. But still, I think that there is a problem, and that in a democracy, we must sometimes mm, uh, look at the things with courage and discuss anything that comes to our mind uh, and anything that seems important uh, to us. Well, that's more or less, I could speak another two hours, but I think that um, you wish I wouldn't. And, uh, I'm sure that you would like to maybe to ask uh, about investment possibilities, about taxes, about uh, how we react to certain things in the West, you know, like, uh, for instance, uh, um, religion. Uh, there is a, a huge problem with religion. You were good enough to mention the Pope's visit. I was at the Vatican for many, many years, and I know this Pope. By the way, I'm so, so old, they say, that I've uh, known five popes. <laughs> you can imagine. Already five. And uh, uh, his visit to Lithuania was very important but because he knew how to speak to Lithuanians. He knows Lithuania very well. And uh, uh, we were delighted. You know, we sometimes have problems with our minorities. We have solved them in Lithuania, at least. We have solved them, I think, very satisfactorily. Any Russian could become Lithuanian citizen without any conditions, any time, any moment. And quite a lot of Russian officers, maybe some people were even not very happy about that, but could become Lithuanian citizens, and some Russian officers became uh, Lithuanian citizens. And there is a Polish minority also, which is not really Polish, but it's just Belarusian, and they don't even probably feel very Polish or Belarusian, but they, are, uh, they have a beautiful revolutionary mind, and it's very difficult to talk to them. <laughs> but <laughs> the, Oh, you know, the revolutionary minds are sometimes useful because they provoke you and, and, uh, and by the way, I'm convinced that a minority is always a contribution. To have a minority like in America is a good thing and not a bad thing. But the Pope, who is, uh, who is a Pole, uh, as you know, he found a very nice formula and he said, you Lithuanians of Polish origin. And it never came to my mind to use it. And I am a little bit jealous that it came to, to the Pope. Because it's a wonderful expression, it's a wonderful solution for this minority to say, you are Lithuanians, you are Lithuanian citizens, but of Polish origin, and you have a right to keep your Polish characteristics and your Pol Polish traditions and so on, because all the, the, the the whole country will only uh, become richer if uh, you stay with us and you work uh, with us. So we are very grateful to the Pope 
and um, we realized that it was a huge historical, his trip was of huge historical importance. But now I would like really to stop because I think that I've been talking for 45 minutes, which is against my, my tradition. I thank you very much for your patience. And uh, the observation was made that anti-Semitism has existed in uh, the former Soviet Union. And the question, I think, is would you comment upon that phenomenon in general today, but most specifically uh, within Lithuania? Yes. Uh, I'm very, very happy to say that there is no anti-Semitism today in Lithuania. By the way, only 12,000 Jews are still in Lithuania. Of them, the real Lithuanian Jews who were living for centuries in Lithuania are only 2,000. The other 10,000 came from the former Soviet Union. But we now have, first of all, an agreement with the Jewish communities in America also to restore Jewish monuments, to uh, help and organize. As you know, Vilnius, our capital city, was called the second Jerusalem in Europe to restore archives and libraries. And we have a wonderful uh, man who is the chief rabbi, uh, an Englishman, but an exceptional personality who is working with other Jewish organizations in, um, in, in the West and, you know, restoring what has been left by, by the horrible events during the war and, uh, and um, after the war. Um, I would say that there is absolutely no anti-Semitic uh, uh, sentiments, feelings whatsoever. I yes. should have uh, done that. The, the question was, uh, the ambassador had mentioned the Kaliningrad area, and the, the question is, what would he do to solve that particular problem? To tell, you, uh, to tell you frankly, I think that the joint venture of Poland, Lithuania, Germany, Russia would be the beginning. We should concentrate our efforts, all the people together, and do something in that uh, region. It would be for the good not only of the region in the first place, but it would be uh, for the good of all the neighboring countries. I would say that only the co cooperation between Germany and Russia would not be a good one. And please don't repeat it to the German ambassador when he comes here. <laughs> He's already <laughs> a little bit cross with me. But, <laughs> so, but it is between you and me. And uh, I think that this is the first step. And let's not go too uh, too far because uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit uh, difficult and I wouldn't like to, you know, to provoke anything <laughs> with my words. Yes, sir. No. The, uh, the question was, what is the status of Russians within Lithuania, especially those who had, uh, I suppose, come during the uh, uh, period of the Soviet Union? Well, um, you mentioned ethnic tensions. I would say that there are no ethnic tensions in Lithuania right now. Absolutely no uh, ethnic tensions. There are some, well, uh, some discussions with the Polish uh, minority, um, but not with the Russians. We, um, we are very glad that they are out. We are very glad that some of them have chosen to stay in Lithuania, and if they are loyal citizens of Lithuania, I think we will accept it. We have done it before in 1919, when the so-called white Russians came to Lithuania and were a very important cultural and, uh, yes, in, in the first place, cultural contribution uh, to the country. Uh, those who left, uh, who left the army or who stayed behind, they, have, they can choose. They can uh, be Lithuanian citizens, uh, apply for Lithuanian citizenship. They have a, another year to go and they can do it. Or they can stay as foreigners, but I would say that uh, they, they, there is no interest for them to stay as foreigners because there would be some uh, you know, some uh, limitations in their activity as 
all foreigners in a foreign country uh, have. So I would say that uh, the situation of ethnic minorities is satisfactory. The situation in Latvia and Estonia is a little bit different, but I beg you really to remember one thing. Always, when you hear about ethnic um, uh, problems in Latvia and Estonia, I'm talking on their behalf, if I may, they, uh, the Russians came, some of them were very good, but they came with uh, an army of occupation of the Soviet Union. And some people just can't forget it. And you must imagine how the Estonians feel when they are almost the minority in their own country. And therefore, certain reactions, if there would be certain reactions, uh, are humanly understandable. Uh, in Latvia, mm, Russians are also 40% of the country. In our country, they are a, a, a tiny minority in a, in a way. And you know why? Because we had a military resistance for a, about for starting 1944 till 1952. And the Russians never wanted to come, the colonists and so on, our workers and, and uh, civilians never wanted to come to Lithuania. And therefore, we have um, about 200,000 of uh, uh, ethnic Russians in Lithuania today. To what extent do you plan to use fossil fuels? Do you have a supply of fossil fuels? Do you have a nuclear plan? No, we have no fo fossil fuel at all. I would say we have it in Poland, which is not far away, but still if we would, for instance, um, change the whole uh, functioning of the nuclear power plant in Ignalina, uh, there is a way now of changing these and making, for instance, uh, fuel, um, fossil fuel uh, powered plant. It would need probably about 2,000 to 3,000 coal carriages or wagons a day. And that is unrealistic. What to do? This is a great problem. Really a very great problem. I think that we must solve uh, this problem together with neighboring countries, with the Scandinavian countries. And the first step, I would say, the minimum step, would be together with the French, who are, uh, have a certain experience in this field, and they have the power, the electrical power in France is produced, 80% of the electrical power is already produced by nuclear uh, power plants. I think that we c could maybe uh, start uh, changing the units we have. We have four units. Uh, one is uh, closed now. Uh, three are functioning, but we could, we could change them and uh, modernize uh, the plant, at least at the beginning. Otherwise, the plant will die natural, its natural death in about six to seven years. But it is in a way, also a source of, uh, well, of uh, hard currency, if we organize it well. The question is, how is your monetary system surviving or enduring, given the transition to a uh, command uh, society? Well, there is an inflation, and you will be amazed. What an inflation. That's here we... We have, last year, we had a 1,120% inflation in 12 months. This year, we are very glad, maybe, we will have an inflation of 450%, which is an enormous progress. It's not because of the privatization. It's because of so many factors, of so many factors. And... Uh, uh, we have introduced our national currency a few months ago, and it is, in a way, a little bit artificially, a very highly, the change with the dollar is today, it started at 460 liters for one dollar, today it's three liters for one dollar. It's almost like the Swiss franc. 
And uh, some people are very proud of this. Well, I am not proud of this because I don't think that the currency must be, you know, highly, uh, very expensive. Currency is like, like, as you know, like a commodity in a way. It should be adapted to the needs of the economy. We must export and therefore l the litters should go down. And I hope that the Bank of Lithuania will do whatever they can and let litters just go down till it will cost, let's say, we will pay six liters or s even seven liters for one dollar. And that would be very good for the, uh, for the exports. But, um, but it shows you why. One of the reasons is that the fuel we were, the, the crude oil we were buying in uh, Russia went thousand times the price increased thousand times. The World Bank has told Russia that it can't uh, sell us any, not only to us, but to uh, all other countries, the crude oil uh, asking a special price. Uh, they must ask the world price. And it means that from the special price we were paying Russia for the crude oil, it went up and it went up a thousand times. Uh, a retired man today gets about five dollars a month. It doesn't mean that it, you, of course, it, the, the, the 10 or 15 liters it gets can buy a little bit more than you could buy with five dollars in America. But still, it is incredible how people live and how difficult it is for older people uh, to live. And yet, what can we do? There is a budget which is balanced because the World Bank asks us to balance the budget. We can't uh, have any deficits because otherwise we will not get credits from the World Bank and International Monetary F Fund. And, uh, and the economy is not yet turning. We're not exporting enough, and therefore we can't even offer money to the, uh, for instance, to the old people. And in about 15 years, we will have probably one third, mm, yes, more than four, uh, one fourth, but one third of the population will have more than 65 or 70 years. And therefore, it's a huge problem. And therefore, I come again and I say, this must be uh, considered today and we must think about it and we must try uh, find solutions as, as soon as possible which solutions I really uh, that would be a very long discussion what are the incentives know? <laughs> <laughs> what are the incentives for uh, business to come into Lithuania well, as a matter of fact, I was waiting for such a question. <laughs> World Trade Center, after all. You know, well, the incentive, I will tell you in a few words. The incentive is Lithuania is the ge geographical, and nobody knows it probably. I'm sorry to say so. Uh, and it is unbelievable. It is the geographical center of Europe, geographically. That's about uh, almost 2,000 kilometers to the Ural Mountains. Uh, to the east and 2,000 kilometers to Spain. It has a port, it has good infrastructure, it has people who speak uh, foreign languages, and it is also a door to the former Soviet Union. And therefore, the incentive already, you know, uh, a, a very strong incentive, um, you, you see um, that they are very strong and very important. But there are other incentives, for instance, tax incentives. For uh, six years, you don't pay any taxes on your profits. You are free to take out your profits from Lithuania. You can produce whatever uh, you want to produce. There are hardly any limits. Well, probably you couldn't uh, start a joint venture and produce arms or, or things like that. 
but even even that, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if you come with a good offer, <laughs> oh, we might consider it. Um, uh, labor. The labor is good. It must be only directed, well directed. It has to be motivated. This is a very uh, important thing, the motivation, which never existed because nobody cared to work well. You never got more. If you worked we uh, uh, better, for instance, in the Soviet Union, you would not get anything more. It was not a private thing. Nobody cared about this. You, you could sit somewhere, for instance, doing nothing or almost and get the same sum of money uh, as the man who would work uh, 12 hours or 8 hours a day. So if you give them motivation, it, it is a very good labor. It is a cheap labor, still a very cheap labor. And therefore, I would say that it was a, at a certain moment uh, even uh, well, my, 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 maybe I, I let my imagination run away, but uh, I thought we could have a certain Hong Kong in the Baltic countries with, you know, ec uh, uh, free economic zones, areas, where people could produce anything they wanted and export, the, <coughs> export these things to Uzbekistan or, 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 or Turkestan or, or uh, uh, I mean, whatever they, w they wanted. This is one of the solutions. Why not? I mean, Hong Kong is very far, and it will not exist in a few years. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> yes, in 96. The address of the uh, embassy, if you'd like to give it, Mr. Ambassador, that would be acceptable. Yeah. No, I, I don't think that I have to read the, uh, the address. <laughs> <laughs> I still know it. It's 2622 16th Street. That's the street which starts at the White House and it goes up to the north. 2622 16th Street. And, well, of course, the, it, it is in the direct telephone directory. Yes. Well. And uh, it's been there, by the way, since 1922, when the Free Lithuania in that time bought the building from a very rich old lady. And it's a very interesting building. We have neighbors, the Cuban embassy, the Polish embassy, the Italian embassy, the Mexican, Spanish embassy, and so on. It's an enclave of well, usually now it's the Massachusetts Avenue, the Diplomatic Avenue, but we still want to be there on the 16th Street. Northwest, of course. <laughs> ah, <well. Let> <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, we've had a, a series of programs on the, on the former Soviet Union. We were lucky and fortunate enough to have Mr. Strobe Talbot and Bob Kaiser of the Washington Post, Mr. Goebel, an expert on nationalities and the ambassadors of... My good friend. Your, yes. Indeed, Mr. Yes. Goebel. Oh, yes. You, you have the same sense of humor. That should have been, should be wonderful. And, of course, the ambassadors of, of Russia, Ukraine, and then from an outside look, Finland. And our great hope, of course, was to get a glimpse, not to become diplomats, as you suggested earlier, but to, to get a, uh, a, a glimpse at the fascinating uh, circumstance in which you find yourself of transition to a, a healthy society and a healthy regime. And I do believe that you've touched upon all those major variables that we would have liked to have seen touched upon and uh, provided us with what was not only an enjoyable but an extraordinarily informative evening, for which we thank you very much. Thank you.